Well, we've just celebrated the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the document that declared that our country is sovereign and will not be governed by any other nation. All over the country there were fireworks displayed. How many of you went to a fireworks display this week? You know, or, or, saw, or shot off some fireworks or something, you know. Uh, we took our grandkids and we watched fireworks with them in Hendersonville there. Then we discovered the next night on the actual 4th of July evening uh, that there were enough fireworks being shot off in the lake <laughs> near our house. That next year we're just going to sit on our front porch and enjoy it from there. So uh, anyways, it was fun. It was exciting and, and uh, beautiful. Uh, and uh, the skies were blazing with it. Uh, but the, it's, a, it's a memorializing of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, which was adopted by Congress then on July the 4th, 1776. And the key words, though, that ring out to us are that we hold these truths to be self-evident, uh, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator. Aren't you glad that the document announcing our freedom recognizes the Creator? You know, with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And in those poignant words, the Creator is given credit as being the originator of liberty uh, that frees human beings to really enjoy life. And later, the author, Thomas Jefferson, and of course other people helped him to edit it later, but uh, uh, he's the primary uh, writer of the Declaration. He spoke these words, God who gave us life gave us liberty. Can the liberty of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? Well, I dare say they will be less secure if that's the case. It is a time that is set aside to also remember the price that was paid for the liberty that we enjoy in this nation. And uh, each man who signed that Declaration of Independence took a risk of great loss. I just recently watched a miniseries about the adult life of John Adams, our second president, who was very instrumental in uh, negotiating things behind the scenes. And uh, each man who signed the Declaration of Independence uh, took a risk, and that was shown in that, that miniseries. And I recommend that you watch that sometime. We reflect on what happened to the 56 men who signed that document. Five signers were captured by the British as traitors and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two signers lost their sons in the Revolutionary Army, while another had two sons captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds or the hardships of the Revolutionary War. And that was a tremendous price to pay for signing that document, wasn't it? Uh, and I hope that we all value that price uh, and use our voting rights uh, when it comes especially to the general election where we elect our presidents and our House of Congress and our Senate, that we will ask for God's wise counsel in casting those votes. And uh, so we have that right given to us uh, in this country, and please take advantage of that to uh, follow the Lord's guidance in casting your vote. But, you know, I don't want to talk about that so much this morning. I want to talk about a different kind of liberty, that God is the author of liberty, and with that truth in mind, uh, we have the greatest cause to celebrate the price paid for our spiritual freedom uh, and liberty from the tyranny of sin and from eternal death. And that's the price that Jesus Christ paid for us, and there's nothing political about that choice. Uh, and uh, uh, he, made, he, he made the vote, the only vote necessary himself, along with the Heavenly Father. He chose to lay down his life, and so it was... His vote was the only one that counted, and he did that for us. But I want you to read with me together the announcement that he made as he began his ministry there in his hometown of Nazareth. And he turned in the Bible, and he went to the book of Isaiah, and he read from it. And this is what he said concerning his messianic mission. Uh, so Luke 4, verse 16 is where we get this. So let's read all these scriptures together. Uh, we're going to go all the way through verse 21. Okay, are you ready? So he came to Nazareth, and he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. When he was handed, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives uh, and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him and he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, the background for this, of course, is that Jesus has been baptized by John. And then after that baptism, uh, the, the Spirit of God came down. So he descended like a dove upon him. And the Lord God, our Heavenly Father, announced that he was pleased in his beloved Son. Uh, and the... The Spirit then led him into the wilderness where he was unsuccessfully tempted by the devil. Then the scripture says he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. And so then he went to his hometown to announce he was the fulfillment of the promised Messiah there in the book of Isaiah. And he announced his mission as that same one. And it was his declaration of independence, if you please. So if you might want to just look at that passage as, as the Declaration of Independence for all believers today. And that's what we celebrate as Christians. Did you note the twice appearance of the word liberty in these, this passage? It is a very interesting thing to note that the pri primary uh, meanings of the word translated liberty are three things. One is the word freedom. Uh, secondly, forgiveness. And the third word is remission. Uh, and the mission of Jesus Christ would include all three of those things and, and providing liberty, uh, freedom, forgiveness, and remission of sins and guilt for all of us. First of all, it would include proclaiming good news to the poor. Now, what does this mean? It means there was a hope for a better life uh, for those who were living in poverty, both materially and and spiritually and in, act, and in terms of eternal life, but a better life was in store. He was proclaiming a chance for the freedom not to be poor. Now, I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel this morning. I'm just telling you that anybody who is poor and acknowledges and confesses Jesus Christ as Lord is going to have a better life because of it, and no matter what their status is in this world. Poverty is defined in a variety of ways. For instance, what we think of as poverty here in America looks very differently, uh, different in third world countries. Uh, I'm sure that the Kenya missions team uh, had an eyeful of what poverty is like in that nation, in Africa, and while they were ministering there. It's, a, it's a radically defined by the lifestyles of the 160 million untouchables of India who are impoverished by a cruel caste system that says they are less than human. So we see a, a just, just stark in the depth, the intense poverty of those untouchables. Then we see even poverty in this nation. And some of us have experienced that. And nothing like those people. But, uh, you know, during most of my childhood, during my, because of my father's unexpected illness, my mother worked for a very low wage. She worked for about a dollar an hour uh, back then. And, and uh, uh, she... Uh, uh, had to draw uh, help from the state welfare system to, to care for us as her children. And, and, and we also received help from this extended family. And we were poor. But you know what? We knew the Lord. And there's something about knowing Him and having our faith in Him that I didn't feel poor. You know, we literally were materially poor. But I didn't feel that way. Why? Because I was rich in Christ. And rich in love among friends and people around me. And, you know, there was just a, a, a depth of, 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 you know, of the blessing of God that I experienced. So I really didn't feel poor. Uh, and, uh, but the good news is that when, when Christ redeems someone who is impoverished, there's this thing that happens in a person's soul. I think of it as redemption and lift. There is a newborn hope that a new life has come that will lead to freedom from the entrapment of any kind of poverty. Uh, the poverty of every kind. Uh, and in my own life, a deep faith in Christ was awakened as a young person and I dreamed of a better life. I dreamed of going to college and getting a good education. Uh, you know, I believe that God placed that in my heart. I, I didn't have any money to go to college, but I believe somehow I could go. And you know what? God provided a means for me to go. 
Uh, and my parents didn't give me a dime toward my college education. But God provided me with jobs and help and scholarships and all kinds of things, you know, that helped me get through school. That was born in my heart because I belonged to Him and I was redeemed by Him, you know. And so, uh, you know, my parents had that same ambition for me and my sister and my brother as well. And so it involved a lot of hard work, but it involved also a whole lot of God's grace. And so He blessed in spite of the poverty I'd experienced as a youngster. Last year, we heard from Gospel of Asia about the conditions in India and about these horribly oppressed and impoverished children in India who were being rescued from the streets where they beg and eat the garbage from other people's homes uh, and just uh, treated like dogs. Uh, and, and through caring believers, many of them are now receiving an education and will be blessed by their freedom from their deep poverty. But they're going to have a spiritual blessing as well and a spiritual prosperity in their souls. Just this past year, a fellow believer was, had a vision for the redemption and lift of impoverished widows in Kenya. And the program has been put into place. It's begun in a way to assist these widows in being self-supporting by starting their own businesses. Uh, and not only are they able to grow in their walk with God, but also to be set free from the prison of poverty that they've been in. Uh, this is in addition to what Don and Nancy Richards are doing there uh, to assist the people there in a healthier environmental lifestyle uh, that is also equipping them to grow their own food supply. And so, you know, the work of Christ in people uh, is able to deliver them and set them free from all kinds of poverty. In these situations, though, uh, the accumulation of spiritual wealth is obviously the greatest uh, benefit of all. And this all started with the proclamation of good news that Jesus gave to the poor. An invitation to escape from that prison. Then there's spiritual poverty that imprisons people's souls without regard to economic status. Uh, though not materially poor, there are many who are spiritually bankrupt today. And their souls are bound up in character disorders and habitual lying and bitterness and abusive attitudes. And they're just a mess. Uh, and there's a poverty of meaning as well and unhealthy relationships and the ability to love. Uh, and there's a, a string of hurt and brokenness behind them because of that spiritual poverty. Uh, there's a wake of broken families and generations of bitterness because of it. But Christ sets free from spiritual poverty. Uh, there is a proverbial being set free from the miry clay that Christ accomplishes in people's lives. We're reminded again of John Newton, the author of the, of the song Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. He was a greedy captain of a slave ship. And he had plenty of money, but was spiritually bankrupt. Uh, Christ changed his life. And he abandoned the slave trade and became a strong voice for the abolition of slavery in Great Britain and a preacher of the gospel. He experienced liberty from spiritual poverty and the forgiveness of his sins, and the remission of his guilt before God. He no longer was condemned, but free of condemnation. It was all because of that very wonderful, amazing grace of God through Christ and what he had done for him. And he wrote that song, uh, you know, he said, uh, about that amazing grace of God that saved a wretch. What does wretch mean? It means somebody who is, who is extremely... Uh, bound up in spiritual poverty and bankruptcy. That's what a wretch is. And he said, Christ saved me from that pit. Uh, even though he had plenty of funds, plenty of money, great business going economically, he was saved in his soul and it changed his life. The Freedom de Declaration of Jesus included also the healing of the brokenhearted. Uh, there are people whose souls have been fragmented by loss and by the sins of others. Uh, broken marriages and by deep regrets. Sometimes their internal sorrow can be overwhelming. It is like a prison due to damaged and broken, uh, damaged and broken emotional framework. It can be a perpetual prison of brokenness. And personalities and emotional health have been damaged and they're in need of healing and wholeness. Well, I tell you that Jesus Christ came and proclaimed freedom for the brokenhearted to be made whole. Uh, one of our own members, Paula Martin here, uh, and uh, was for many years imprisoned by the darkness of depression and self-depreciation. 
uh, but through faith in Christ, she was healed. Now, this is, you might be asking, why are you telling that? You know, well, she wrote a book about it. She's told the whole world about it. So I can tell it, I guess. Right. And uh, so, you know, she wrote this great book about faith and how she was set free from that broken heartedness in her life, that fragmented situation in her soul. And I recommend that you talk, talk to her after service. See if she still has any more of those. Do you have any more of them? OK, well, you need to read that uh, because it, it's a great blessing. Uh, so, uh, you know, the. The healing of the brokenhearted. The Declaration of Independence by Jesus also included proclaiming liberty to the captives. Now, there are several possibilities here. It literally refers to someone held captive like in a kidnapping uh, or as a hostage and to be held at spear point or at gunpoint or whatever, you know. But it's, it's like they're held captive by something that they can't get free from. Uh, and it could possibly refer to people being held captive by demonic spirits. We know that Jesus delivered Mary Magdalene from seven demonic spirits. And there was the demoniac of Gadara. Uh, he was chained up and out of his mind and tormented by many demons. But Jesus set him free and, and, and he was in his right mind. Uh, and he wanted to follow Jesus back to where he to Capernaum, but Jesus said, no, I want you to go and be an evangelist to the ten cities uh, of Decapolis, which was the Gentile part of the, the, off the shore of Galilee. And so uh, he was sent out by Jesus to proclaim the good news. Uh, and so he was set free. He was held captive, but set free. I also think of addictions here. Uh, most addicts, I want to tell you, most addicts do not want to be an addict. That's not what they want. They want to be set free. Uh, and uh, so we, can, we don't be pointing the finger too, too much at these guys, these people, because they want to be set free. But it's like it's got its grip on their lives. And, and it's got its hold on them. It's like being held at gunpoint to those dependencies. And so, but Jesus came to set them free. And he can set people free. And, and I know when I was directing Christian recovery programs with Teen Challenge, uh, a government study showed that, uh, that for recovering heroin addicts who had gone through the Teen Challenge programs, which was Christian uh, Holy Spirit filled uh, program, uh, it's you know, classes on the Word of God, teaching them about Jesus, discipling them to follow the Lord, that uh, when they had completed the whole program, heroin addicts uh, who had been straight for five years, it, it was an 80% thing, success rate. Uh, in other words, they started the program, they went through it, it was about a year in length. Uh, when they finished, then they were clear, clean from heroin for five years, 80% of them. Uh, and when that was compared to a government program uh, that was uh, dependent upon methadone treatment, uh, it, it was like a 1% recovery rate compared to the other. And so when Teen Challenge was asked by government authorities what the secret was to their success, do you know what they said? It's the Jesus factor. It's the Jesus factor. It's Jesus Christ who sets free from addiction. And so we praise the Lord that that can happen. And I know many who have been set free, and some who are preaching the gospel today because they were set free from addiction. And we praise God for that. Uh, so uh, there are some who are held captive by regrets and self-condemnation from sins of the past. Sometimes we feel that we are on probation with God. You know, if, you know, if we've done, done some things and we feel that condemnation, even after we confess Christ as Lord and Savior, we're still not sure that God totally has forgiven us, you know. And so we, say that we think we're on a lifetime probation program, you know. Well, I want to tell you, when you receive Christ as your Savior, your sins are forgiven, and your, sins, your guilt of sin is remitted, that's what liberty means, uh, then it's, well, it, it's done. It's 100%, okay? And you don't have to be thinking that you're on probation with God because of the things that you've done because He doesn't remember your sins against you anymore. And you have fellowship with Him because of it. Uh, so Jesus and His declaration of independence proclaimed that He came to set free those held captive. His declaration of independence announced liberty to those who are oppressed. The literal, literal meaning of the word oppressed here is bruised. He pronounced liberty to those who were bruised uh, or injured. 
And it carries the idea, really, of being abused. Uh, I have come to the conclusion, guys, that eventually every person in our fallen world will experience some form of abuse that may leave a deep bruise. And that bruise will be painful for a long time. But Jesus came to set us free from those bruises and to bring healing. There are many types of abuse. There's the physical abuse, sexual abuse, financial abuse, political abuse, verbal abuse, psychological abuse, manipulation abuse, religious abuse, and spiritual abuse, and a few others I didn't mention. Uh, if the literal, the result is the literal or felt sense of being beat down and oppressed. That's when you know you've been abused. Okay, and this is a prison. Uh, it creates a prison of isolation. Because people who have been abused are afraid. They're afraid to venture out and trust anybody anymore. They don't want to be beat down again or over and over like they have in their past. And so that beating down, that oppression, is a, there's a desire to be set free from that. Uh, the, one time Vicki and I were out up in the mountains uh, near Gatlinburg and we went to a restaurant. And the guy who was serving us, he found out I was a pastor and he said, well, I'm a minister too. And... Uh, I said, you are? And, and uh, are you bivocational? Are you serving here to, to help feed your family while you're pastoring a church? And he said, no, I'm not pastoring anymore. And he began to, to open his heart and wept right in front of us and told us about the spiritual abuse he had experienced in the church where he had been a pastor. Uh, he is in one of those churches where you have some real meanies, you know. Uh, and, and they beat up on every pastor that comes to the, in, there and takes a place behind the pulpit. And he was so beat down. And so I began to share with him some of the spiritual abuse I've experienced over the years. You know, and I said, you know what? But Jesus Christ helped me get up and going again. Don't stay down, brother. And so Vicky and I prayed with him that day. And I don't know what happened after that. But I pray that he found freedom to pastor a church again. And uh, so that happens in our, in our lives, doesn't it? Jesus came to set us free from the isolation and fear due to any kind of abuse. And so then the Declaration of Independence by Jesus uh, also was the proclamation of the acceptable year of the Lord. Uh, this is called the year of the Lord's favor. What does favor mean uh, in the New Testament? Grace. The year of the Lord's grace. Uh, and uh, it's it, as well as the year of jubilee. In Leviticus chapter 25, verse 9, this is what we read. He said, Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. Uh, and the, the, On the day of atonement, you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land, and you shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all of its inhabitants. And it shall be a Jubilee uh, for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. That fiftieth year shall be a Jubilee for you. So this proclamation was called Jubilee. You know what the word Jubilee means? It means a great stream of sound. Fireworks. Only they use trumpets. <laughs> you know, so there were people blowing trumpets all over Israel on the year, in the year of Jubilee, on the Day of Atonement, when it came. Just you could hear trumpets everywhere, you know, like fireworks everywhere. Uh, announcing the year of liberty had come. And so it was a blessing because the, the Day of Atonement was where uh, the high priest would, would uh, uh, kill a goat uh, and they'd take that goat's blood and he'd sprinkle it on the mercy seat of God uh, and then he would take the other goat, sprinkle some of that first goat's blood on it and he'd let it out into the wilderness and the thought was that it was carrying away the sins of the people you know, for, on, on their behalf. And so that's what atonement does. And so other things that were involved was the forgiveness of debts, reuniting with family, restoration for what has been lost, rest from striving, dependent trust in the Lord and his provision instead of our own striving, and freedom from oppression. And so as we reflect on liberty today, this liberty that's provided by Jesus, we quickly can see that it included all of these things. Through his atoning death, freedom from condemnation has come to us. Mercy. The debt of sin is forgiven. Our guilt is remitted. We are reunited with the household and the family of God uh, as joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Uh, restoration from loss is happening through redemption and lift as well as his healing touch. Instead of conflict, 
uh, with God due to sin, we are at peace with Him and we can rest in the truth that we cannot please God by our own efforts. Jesus has brought us to a place of rest from striving. We also rest in the trust of God's provision of grace that is sufficient for all things that we go through. He then gives us freedom in the oppression of spiritual warfare and the enemy seeks to oppress and abuse. But greater is he who's within us than he who's in the world. Amen. Independence Day in America has been celebrated with fireworks. The year of Jubilee, celebrated with loud trumpet sounds, uh, announcing liberty, the, the year of Jubilee. Our Independence Day from the tyranny of sin, from brokenheartedness, from captivity, from having been bruised and abused, was announced by the sound of hammers and nails. Driving those nails into the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. That's what announced our year of Jubilee. There weren't any trumpet sounds that day except in heaven. All the world became silent as the Son of God gave himself to die for us. We celebrate that with the sharing of the Lord's Supper, commemorating the Lord's death to set us free till he comes. The message of the cross of Christ is our declaration of independence because he laid down his life for us. And that's what we're going to do today to close out our service. We're going to share the cup and the bread of communion. If you're visiting with us today and you know Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you're welcome to partake with us. We do not have a closed communion. Everybody who knows the Lord is welcome to share in it with us. So just take the bread and the cup and hold it in your hand so that we can share it all together. And note the words of this song. Uh, and uh, nothing holding me back. What does that mean? It means freedom. Nothing holding us back means liberty and freedom. We are free to live in Christ. Praise the Lord.